Let's pray together. Our Father, we thank you very much for this Congress. Thank you for the leaders, the workers, your children and your servants that were brought together in this Congress. We're praying, O oh Lord, that your spirit will keep on impressing the truth in every heart. And we pray, Lord, you'll so transform us and work within us that you'll be able to walk through us as we go back to our local churches in Jesus' name. We pray, Lord, the impact of this Congress in our lives will bring a great, great impact upon the people back at home as we go back to continue our ministries in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name, we pray. Everybody said... Keep on standing, please. At the back of your program booklet, please repeat after me. My commitment. I am part of the fellowship of the unashamed. I have the Holy Spirit power. The die is cast. I've stepped over the line. My decision is made. I'm a disciple of his. I won't look back. I won't let up. I won't slow down. I won't back away. I won't be still. Say it loud. My past is redeemed. My present makes sense. My future is secure. I am finished and done with low living. With sight walking, with small planning, with smooth knees, with colorless dreams, with tamed visions, with mundane talking, with cheap living, with dropped goals. I no longer need preeminence or prosperity or position. Say it loud, or position or promotion, or plaudits, or popularity. I don't have time to be right, to be first, to be top, to be recognized, to be praised, to be regarded, or to be rewarded. I now live by faith. I lean on his presence. I walk by patience. I live by prayer. I labor by power. My face is set. My gait is fast. My goal is heaven. My road is narrow. My way rough. My companions few. My guide reliable. My mission is clear. I cannot be bought. I cannot be compromised. I cannot be detoured. I cannot be lured away. I cannot be turned back. I cannot be deluded or delayed. I will not flinch in the face of sacrifice. I will not hesitate in the presence of the adversary. I will not negotiate at the table of the enemy. I will not ponder at the pool of popularity. I will not meander in the maze of mediocrity. I won't give up. I won't shut up. I won't let up. Until I've stayed up. Until I've stood up. Until I've prayed up. Until I've paid up until I preach up the cause of Christ. I'm a disciple of Jesus. I must go until he comes. I must give until I drop. I must preach all I know and walk until he stops me. And when he comes for his own, he will have no problem recognizing me. My banner will be clear. Amen. You can be seated. A series of Bible teachings and revival sessions 
are taken from Revelation chapters 2 and 3. And they form the message of the Lord Jesus Christ to the churches of Asia Minor. If you open Revelation chapter 1, verse 11, here the Lord Jesus Christ was talking to John, the beloved, the one that the Lord used in writing these messages, inspired of the Spirit of God, coming from the Lord Jesus Christ to the seven churches in Asia Minor. And in Revelation chapter 1, verse 11, saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. And what thou seest, write in a book and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia. Number one, unto Ephesus. Number two, unto Smyrna. Number three, unto Pergamos. Number four, unto Tyra. Number five, unto Sardis. Number six, unto Philadelphia. Number seven, unto Laodicea. So you find the Lord writing these messages. Actually, they are letters or epistles from the Lord to these seven churches. And let me just talk about the seven churches to start with. That is the message. These messages in these letters to the churches, they have, number one, a primary association. Number two, a personal application. Number three, a prophetic anticipation. What I mean by this, number one, there is a primary association. The messages you will find, they deal with real churches. So, there was a primary audience, a primary association. These churches actually existed at that time, number two. A personal application. In each of these messages, at the end of each message to every church, you'll find he that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. Therefore, there is a personal application. But number three, there is a prophetic anticipation. The prophetic anticipation you'll find as you read the messages of Christ. Going to all these churches, these letters contain prophecy. And the Lord was calling upon the churches and calling upon us today that we look forward, we anticipate, and we prepare for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The first letter, the first message is sent to the church in Ephesus, actually sent to the leader there. And this first letter, it says in Revelation chapter 2, Revelation chapter 2 verse 1, unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write. You see this angel is not an angel in heaven, is the leader of the church. The one that the Lord has chosen to guide the church, lead the church, feed the church, help the church, so that that church will be like God, like Christ wants that church to be. And it says to this leader, to the angel of the church of Ephesus, right? These things says he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. Uh, you are talking about Ephesus now. Ephesus was a well-known city in those days. It was actually a city with famous games. It was like a city that housed the Olympic of today. And then it had pagan religion. If you read in the Acts of the Apostles, you'll find when those people came together and they were shouting in praise of Diana, their God. And it was also a notorious center of idolatry. Idolatry was rampant there. Not only that, it was overspread with superstition. Obviously, where you have paganism and idolatry, you're going to have a lot of superstition. In fact, a famous philosopher of that day, of that period, said, no one could live in Ephesus without weeping at its immorality. Not a Christian, not a believer, not a New Testament follower of Jesus Christ, and yet, as a philosopher looking at Ephesus, the immorality, the tradition, the idolatry, the evil there, it was so much that these philosophers said, no one, no reasonable person, no intelligent person, nobody that is sensitive to moral, spiritual values could live in Ephesus without weeping at its immorality. And yet, Christ had a church there. Not an ordinary church, a dynamic church. 
a strong church in that Ephesus. Well, the Lord used a number of people in Ephesus that he used in that church. He used Aquila and Priscilla. He used Apollos. He used Paul. He used Timothy. And that's why today sometimes you wonder in your church, a pastor had been there before. Then another pastor comes. And then another pastor comes. And then another pastor comes. Just like the church of Ephesus. As you look at Acts of the Apostles, let's see. Acts of the Apostles, I'm reading to you from verse 18. Acts 18. And I'm reading from verse 19. Acts 18. Verse 19. Here it tells us, And he came to Ephesus and left them there. And but he himself entered into the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews when they desired him to tarry longer, a longer time with them. He consented not, but bid them farewell, saying, I must by all means keep this feast that cometh in Jerusalem. But I will return again unto you, if God will, and he sailed from thence from Ephesus. In verse 24, in verse 24 it says, And a certain Jew named Apollos, born at Alexandria, an eloquent man, and mighty in the scriptures, came to Ephesus. And then you come to chapter 19, reading from verse 1. And it came to pass... That while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coasts, came to Ephesus and finding certain disciples in verse 17. Here we're told, and this was known unto all the Jews and the Greeks also dwelling at Ephesus, and fear fell on them all. And the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. And many that believed came and confessed and showed their deeds. Many of them also who, that used curious arts brought their books together and bunched them before all men. And they counted the price of them and found it 50,000 pieces of silver. So mightily grew the word of God and Prevail, chapter 20, verse 17. In chapter 20, verse 17, Paul called the leaders together and for my leaders. He said to Ephesus, and he called the elders of the church in verse 31. Therefore, watch and remember that by the space of three years, I cease not to warn every one of you, every one night and day of tears. Paul the Apostle spent a long time in Ephesus. Longer than he spent in other places. As you see the people that administered to them, Aquilas and Priscilla, and then you have Apollos, you have Paul the Apostle, even Timothy. Look at 1 Timothy. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, you will see that Timothy also had a ministry there. In 1 Timothy chapter 1 verse 2, Unto Timothy my own son in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God, our Father and Jesus Christ our Lord, as I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus, when I went into Macedonia, that thou mightest charge some that they teach no other doctrine. So you will find that it was a wonderful church that had great privilege of having these great men ministering to them, teaching them, leading them, counseling them, helping them to understand the ways of the Lord and the way of the gospel. And in fact, in later years, the apostle John himself was the pastor in the church at Ephesus before he was banished to the Isle of Patmos. Now we're going to look at this epistle, this message, this letter coming from the Lord Jesus Christ to the church at Ephesus. Please turn with me to Revelation chapter 2. I'm reading to you from verse 1 through to verse 7. Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write, This six is he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand. Walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks, I know thy works, 
and I labor, and I patience, and how thou canst not bear with them which are evil, and thou hast tried them which say the apostles and are not, and hast found them to be liars, and hast born, and hast patience, and for my name's sake hast labored, and hast not fainted. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Remember therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will remove thy candlestick out of its place, except thou repent. But this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. To him that overcometh, when I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. That's the letter that the Lord Jesus Christ, the head of the church, wrote to that church. The message is divided into three parts. Number one, the description and the declaration of Christ the Lord. The description and the declaration of Christ the Lord. Number two, dedication and discernment with consistent labor. Dedication with discernment and discernment with consistent labor. Number three, the decline of and the demand for Christ-like love. The decline of and the demand for Christ-like love. Point number one, the description and the declaration of Christ the Lord. See the way the Lord Jesus Christ introduced himself in Revelation chapter 2 verse 1. Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things says he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks, and whenever letters were written those days, the writer will introduce himself to start with. Today, many people, when we write letters today, things have changed. We'll say, dear John Smith, greetings, ta-ta-ta-ta. After that, yours, sincerely, yours, faithfully, yours in Christ, John. And so you understand that at the present moment now, the writer, he'll put his name last. But at that time, the writer puts the name First. That's why Jesus Christ, in writing to this letter, in writing this letter to the Ephesians, Ephesian believers, he puts his name first, his title first, his credentials, his qualification first. That's reasonable, that's good. That you will know the authority of the one writing. You'll know the credentials of the one writing. You know the right of the one, the position of the one writing. Whether he has a right, he has a position, he has the authority, he has the credentials to speak to you. And Jesus Christ said unto the angel of the church of Ephesus, unto the leader, unto the shepherd, unto the pastor, the pastor teacher of the church in Ephesus, right. Who is writing to you, by the way? It's the one that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand. And it's the one that is walking in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. What does that mean? The stars, as well as the golden candlesticks. Why don't you look at verse 20? The mystery of the seven stars, with thou sawest in my right hand, and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the angels, the leaders, the pastor teacher of the seven churches and the seven candlesticks are that thou sowest at the seven churches. Look at chapter one, chapter two, verse one again. Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus, right? These things says he that holdeth the seven angels, the seven leaders, the seven pastors, the seven teachers in the right in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven churches. The seven golden candlesticks, those are the seven churches. And now see, what the way he introduced himself, he actually had been introduced in chapter 1. When you see the vision of the glorified Christ in chapter 1, you'll see some details about the Lord there. There are two details that are brought out here in this letter. Two details. Number one, he holdeth the leaders of the church. 
He holdeth the seven stars. Number two is walking in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. It's walking in the midst of the churches. Where do we see that first? Chapter 1, verse 12. And, as, and I turned to see the voice that spake with me. And being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. And in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks, one, like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girt about the paths with a golden girdle. Then in verse 20, it tells us the mystery of those seven stars that we have seen, and the mystery of that of the seven golden candlesticks, the leaders of the churches, the churches themselves. And so you see in this description of the Lord Jesus Christ, he reveals himself as the one that is holding the shepherd, and as the one that is also holding the whole church, and as the one that is walking in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks, in the midst of the churches, which gives us assurance, leaders, pastors of churches, that the Lord is holding our hand and you will not fall. And then he tells us that he is moving around. He sees everything. He sees your agony. He sees your tears. He sees the challenges in front of you. And he sees the difficulty of the place you are ministering. He is walking in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. He will never disappoint you. And it's according to the promise he had given before. Look at it in Matthew chapter 18. Matthew chapter 18. The faithful Lord. This is exactly what he said he will do. Matthew chapter 18, reading from verse 20. Matthew 18, verse 20, it says, For where two or three are gathered in my name, gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst of them. And now he comes to introduce himself. I'm walking in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. According to his promise, faithful Christ. In Matthew chapter 28, chapter 28, Matthew 28, reading from verse 18. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. Here is the promise, and lo, I am with you always. He will never leave you. I am with you always, even to the end of the world. And the church of God said, Amen. He is with us. He is with us, and he will take care of us. And that's the reason, because he's walking in the midst of the people of God, we have nothing to fear. Because he tells us that as he holds us, as he keeps us, he has saved us. He has sanctified us. He has anointed us. He has chosen us. He has appointed us as his servants. And he does not leave or abandon his, pe his people after commissioning them. That means then our security is assured if we remain in his hand while doing the work of the Lord. He'll never send you to any place that will not accompany you. He will accompany you there. He will be with you there. And he has appointed us to build his church along with him. And when we submit to his control... We are safe and secured under his authority. When it says, Christ walks in the midst of the church. What does he do? As he walks in the midst of the church, here is what he does, number one, to examine and to evaluate. To examine and to evaluate. That's why you'll find in all the seven churches, he'll say, I know your works. I know your works. I know what you do. Because he's been walking in the midst of the seven churches. And number one, what he does, he evaluates, he examines our work. Number two, to correct and to encourage. To correct and to encourage. That's why in each of the seven churches, he will encourage them. He'll give them commendation and praise for the good things they were doing. And then before he left them, he'll give them correction. To correct and to encourage. Number three is to deliver and to defend in times of danger. He said, I know what you are going through. I know the challenges and the suffering, the persecution you are going through. Never mind, keep on walking. I am walking in the midst of the churches, and I'm there to defend you. The lion of the tribe of Judah, he will defend you. And he will deliver you in times of danger in Jesus' name. 
Number four is to trim our lamps and to pour in oil in our vessel. Is to trim our lamps. Because that's what the priests of those days, the high priests, that's what they will do. They will go into the temple. They will trim the lamps in the temple. And Jesus Christ is our faithful great high priest. And because he's a faithful high priest, he is in the midst of the churches, in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks, so that he can trim our lamps and then pour in the oil of the Holy Ghost in our vessels. Number five is to prune and to purge us for more fruitfulness. To purge us and to prune us for more fruitfulness. I'm the vine. My father is the husband man. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. Every branch that bears fruit, he prunes, he purges, he purifies, that he may bear more fruit. Here is the confidence we have. With Christ, the mighty Christ, so close to us as individual shepherds, so close to us as churches of the living God, we can be strong and faithful at all times. And we shall be strong. Point number two, dedication and discernment with consistent labor. Look at the commendation that Jesus gave to this church. And then you will see what to learn from this church. One, they had dedication and they had discernment with consistent labor, constant labor. It's in Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2, verse 2. I know thy works, and thy labor, and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear with them which are evil. And thou hast tried them, which say they are apostles, and they are not, and hast found them liars. And thou hast born, and hast patience, and for my name's sake hast labored, and hast not fainted. Uh, you see the commendation that the Lord gave them, jump to verse 6 now, but, verse 6, but this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which things I also hate. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. And look at the commendation of the Lord, look at what was said, saying about them. He is the head of the church, and he commended them for their works. For their activities. It is, it is, it's an, this was an active church. Active church. Much, much like our church. By the grace of God. And see what the Lord commended. Number one, labor. Number two, patience. Number three, perseverance. That is, they just went on and on. And they labored to exhaustion. Without telling us that they are tired. Forbearance and discernment. You know the people that came that said they were apostles and they wanted to take their pulpit. They examined them and they saw that they were liars. Much, much like our church by the grace of God. That when you see people that say they are prophets, they are apostles, they are whatever, then our leaders will study them, examine them, question them, and look at the fruit of their work and listen to their message and say, no, this one is fake, this one is counterfeit, this one cannot stand on our pulpit. And they took a firm, uncompromising stand for sound doctrine. That was a commendation for them. The minister and the members of that church, they worked tirelessly, selflessly. They labored to the point of exhaustion, and they were willing to bleed in order to bless others. Did you hear that? And that's exactly, if you're going to be a blessing to people, you must be willing to bleed in order to bless others. Their patience, you'll see, was mentioned twice. If you look at it in verse 2, their, their patience was mentioned. It says, I know thy works, and thy labor, and thy patience. And then if you look at verse 3, and as born, and as patience. Why is their patience mentioned twice? Number one, they had patience in service. Number two, they had patience in suffering suffering for Christ. In their service for Christ, they were patient and they will just persevere and they will just be persistent and they were constant and consistent. They just went on and on and on in service. Patience in service. 
perseverance in service. Number two, patience is suffering for Christ. When suffering came, when persecution came, runs in a hurry to get out of the suffering, they were just patiently, patiently, patiently enduring. They accepted suffering and hardship as they patiently waited for the rewards in glory. This church was commended for laboring, not for the meat which perishes, but for that which endures unto everlasting life. Neither weariness nor personal problems could stop their labor of saving souls and maturing those converts. And it wouldn't that be a good thing said about you. If the Lord could look at you and say, I know your words. I know you labor. I know you serve. I know you preach. And it doesn't matter. The challenge in the ministry on the field where you are. You are there and you keep on doing it without looking at the challenges and the difficulties and the problems. And you're not looking at the smallness of the congregation. You're not looking at the lack of funds or whatever is there. Patience in service and patience in suffering. And then that they, were, they kept on laboring for saving souls and maturing those converts. And our labor to prepare a holy sanctified church for Christ's second coming. We must be like that. We must refuse to give up whatever the challenge, whatever the difficulty. Yes, the road may be rough, and the way is definitely narrow, but we must maintain a forward drive. There's something from within that stirs you up. There's a power of the Holy Ghost within that when others are dropping out and they are falling by the wayside because of the top hard challenges of the way, you're saying, yes, I can still go on. When human strength is exhausted, when human energy is spent and gone, there is strength from above. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. And therefore, you're still able to go on. This church was characterized also by spiritual discernment. They observed and they tried professing apostles and they found them to be deceitful and evil. Let's keep our spiritual eyes sharp, focus, have spiritual eagle eyes, discernment. That in your heart you'll be able to know when somebody is talking, when somebody is preaching, when somebody is quoting the Bible, when somebody is preaching like it's like an Apostle Paul, an Apostle Peter, it's like one of us, and he puts into the introduction and say point one, point two, point three, and don't immediately say, ah, see this preacher, he has points one, two, three. It's one of us. Wait. Look at their families. Look at their relationship with women. Look at how their hands are sticky with money, the steel. Look at the holiness or the lack of holiness in their lives before you make a conclusion. You don't make your conclusion only on the basis that it says, uh, you know, our message today is this and this. I'm going to divide the message to three parts, point one, point two, point three, and then it's, ah, it's one of us, three points. No, test them, examine them, evaluate them, see their lifestyle. See where they stand. See the totality of the doctrine that they bring to you. And just one healing, that doesn't say it all. Just one miracle they perform, that doesn't say it all. One doctrine they teach, that doesn't say it all. One case that looks good, that looks wonderful, that looks inspiring, encouraging. One case does not say it all. Look at that man. See that man. See the ministry. And then you will understand that it may not be be for real. This church at Ephesus, the commendation that the Lord gave is that this church, they will test and find out those apostles and preachers that were not for real. And they rejected and refused those false apostles and false prophets and deceivers, deceitful workers spreading doctrines hated by the Lord. In fact, Jesus said, there's a doctrine out there, the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which I know you hate as I hate it. Now, what's the doctrine of the Nicolaitans? You see, those people were the people, history tells us that they followed after Nicholas, Nicholas Nicolaitans. And they conquered the people. Well, saying, it's all of grace. And since it's all of grace, whatever you do is your flesh. 
Whatever your hand does is your hand. That's not your heart. Whatever your mouth says, whether bad or polluted or dirty, that's your mouth. That's not your spirit. They said, wherever your legs walk to, that's your leg. That's something physical. It doesn't affect your heart, the spirit, your mind. They said, therefore, God is not looking at whatever you do, whatever you say, wherever you go, because those are external things. God is looking at the heart. And there were some people that bought that lie. But there were other people that said, no, that cannot be right. Because the word of God said, who shall ascend to the hill of the Lord? Who shall stand in his holy place? They that have, tell me out loud, clean hands and a pure heart. And then you understand, it says, all this is that people do. Are they stealing? Are they telling lies? That they come out of the heart. Because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So the outflow, the external that people do, if those things are sinful, if those things are evil, then you know it's coming from the heart. If the actions are dirty, the heart is dirty. If the life is dirty, then the heart is dirty. The Bible says, and yield not your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but to yield them as instruments of righteousness and holiness unto God. So, these Ephesians, church, when those Nicolaitans, when they came with their lies, saying this is not important, that is not important, they refused them. They rejected that kind of false doctrine and that kind of lie. As the Lord said, he knew the labor of these Ephesians. He also says he knows the labors of other people too. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, I'm reading from verse 3, remembering without ceasing. Your work of faith and your labor of love and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of God our Father. You'll see here that it's very, very clear. There are three things mentioned here. And it's what the Lord is looking for in your life in my life. Number one, the work of faith. You have faith demonstrated by action. You have love, the labor of love. Demonstrate it in your labor. And you have hope in the Lord, the patience of hope. That's what this church at Ephesus, that's what they had. And Jesus, you know, he mentioned something about them. He said, you have labored and you have not fainted. You have not fainted. You have not fainted. There are some people that faint easily. They get discouraged easily. But for some little, little, little things. Some penny worth, cover worth of problems. And then they are groaning as if it's a thousand naira worth of problem. Very small problem. And it fades very easily. But the commendation of this church is that they fainted not. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 verse 1. Therefore, see, we have this ministry that we have received mercy, we faint not. That is it. We faint not. How is it they did not faint? Verse 16. For which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory, while we look not at things that are seen. That's the problem. While we look not at things that are seen, if you are not going to faint, you will not look at things that are seen. You will not look at those superficial things. You know, some pennyworth minds do some pennyworth things, activities, and those things are worthless, coming from worthless heart. And if you are focusing your attention on those worthless things that sinners say, that backsliders do, you'll faint. But when you know that's a backslider, that's a sinner, doing those worthless things, worthless things coming from worthless mind, on serious mind, producing on serious fruit, on serious action. You don't want to waste your life and waste your concentration on those worthless actions because they produce, they are produced from worthless hearts. That's the reason it says in verse 18, we've made up our minds now. We will not look at things that are seen, but at the things which are not seen. Then it says, because the things which are seen are temporal. 
They're superficial. They're not weighty. They're not serious. Then it says, but the things which are not seen, those are the things that are eternal. In second, in second Corinthians chapter 11, because it says that this church, the commendation Jesus had for them is that there were some people that were claiming to be apostles. And these people claiming to be apostles, they found them that they were just liars. They were deceivers. They were not real, real apostles. And then in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, reading from verse 13, it says, For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. No marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed to the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. Uh, the problem is sometimes there uh, are uh, people who claim to be Christians and they allow themselves to be deceived, to be bought, to be conquered, to be derailed by these so-called apostles with great power. In Romans chapter 16, Verse 17, now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned, and avoid them. Be like this church at Ephesus. And you find that these people, they come with their doctrine, or their messengers, their disciples, their followers. They will come to you with their literature, with their cassette, with their... You, have, have you heard this? Have you seen this? This is something. That's what they always say. This is better. That's always what they always say. This is richer. That's what they always say. Then they will say, well, I know you are deeper life, and you don't appreciate something coming from other places, but this one, this one is different. If you don't listen, how will you know whether it is good or it is bad? That's what they always say. Because they are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into angels of light. And it says what you are going to do is you avoid them. In verse 18, in verse 18, it tells us something about them. For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly. And by good words and fair speeches deceive. The hearts of the simple. In Second John, Second John, I'm reading to you from verse six. In Second John, here is what the Spirit of God said through the apostle of love. Second John, reading from verse six, and this is love that we walk after His commandment. That is where well, the commandment of the Lord, and you walk in line after the commandments of the Lord. This is a commandment that. As ye have heard from the beginning, ye walk in it. Don't change. Remain firm on that same word you heard from the beginning. It says, this is the commandment of the Lord. That as you have heard from the beginning, that although times are changing, politics is changing, government is changing, countries are changing, the world is changing, but the word of God remains firm. So it says that as you have heard from the beginning, we should walk in it. Are there not some people that are already telling us that the dressing of 1973, 1974, you cannot stand by that. This 2003, you cannot stand by that kind of standard now. Are there not people that are telling us all that emphasis on sanctification and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord many, many years ago, and you are trying to bring the conviction of 1976 and 1977 into the life in which we are living now? How can you do that? Times are changing. Are there not people that are telling us to modify, to jettison? Jettison, that means to just neglect, abandon, throw away. The standard you had before, because things are changing now. I don't know people that are telling us that, you know, this um, 
one man, one wife, making restitution, that uh, you need to throw up those things. Are there not people that are telling us to give permission to these Jezebels of their heads palmed and their lips painted and the jewelry and everything, and even their slats permit them to be in the house of the people of God and even to be workers and to do whatever they can do because some of these people, they have talent, they have skill, they have gift, and they were losing a lot of talent. They were telling all these Jezebels to go away. Some of these women are more, they, they are more dynamic and more effective than the men. Allow them. Are there not people that are telling us that we should refrain from going back to the standard we had before? Those are the dangerous people in the midst of the children of God. Because the word of God is saying, this is the commandment. That as ye have heard from the beginning, ye shall walk in it. Then in verse 7 it says, For many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. This is the deceiver and an antichrist. Look to yourselves that we lose not those things which we have wrought, but that we receive a full reward. Whosoever transgresses and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ has not God. I don't care about their title. I don't care about all the history they tell. And you know, some of these deceivers, when they want to deceive, they say, wait a minute. We were talking about deeper life. I was there. Talk about holiness. I preached it. Talk about Congress. I was there. Talk about retreat. I was there. In fact, talk about any meeting in deeper life, planning meeting, I was there. Go and check up your records. No area no meeting that that deeper life had that I didn't preach there. Go and check up. Go and check up. I've been one of the preachers. But what we are telling you is, you know, all these old men, see that man, that gray-headed man, that, that old man. He doesn't understand the modern life. He doesn't understand the younger generation. That's why when he talks, he talks like the old, but you know, we younger people, younger generation, that we know how to touch the string of the lives and the hearts of the younger generation. This is what we are telling you. Those are deceivers. And whatever their qualification, and whatever their title, and whatever their history, and whatever they are telling you, it says whosoever transgresses and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ, he has not God. Whatever testimony they give, he that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. If there come any unto you and bring not this doctrine, receive him not into your house. Neither bid him God speak. For he that biddeth him God speak is a partaker of his evil deeds. And that church in Ephesus, that's what they were wonderful for. They were just wonderful. The Lord said, I know their labor. I see this. But the Lord now corrected them for something. In Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2. I'm reading verses 4 and 5. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against you. Because thou hast left thy first love. Please understand, brothers and sisters, the church is a bride of Christ. And our relationship with him is evidenced and sustained by a warm, fervent love. His love for us is unending. His love for us is uninterrupted. His love for us is undying. We too must love him in return. The first love of this church, as with every true Christian, it was fervent, it was sincere, it was passionate, it was committed, it was obedient, it was submissive. Fervent love, sincere love, passionate love, committed love, obedient love, submissive love. Later, they lost that first love. Listen, number one, they were dedicated to the Lord, dedicated to the Lord. Number two, they were dynamic in labor, dynamic in labor. Number three, they were determined in long suffering. Determined in long suffering. Number four, they were discerning in leadership. Discerning in leadership. Number five, they were disciplined in lifestyle. Dedicated to the Lord. Dynamic in labor. 
determined in long suffering, discerning in leadership, disciplined in lifestyle, but they declined in love. They declined in love. This church at Ephesus, listen, brothers and sisters, they had no excuse at all, excuse at all, to decline in love. Because if there was one thing that the apostle emphasized in his epistle to the Ephesians, it is love. Look at it. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4. Ephesians 1, verse 4, according as he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in what? In love. Verse 15. In verse 15 it says, Wherefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and love towards all the saints, Immediately, he opens chapter 1. He begins to tell them of the observation he had made concerning their love. Look at chapter 2. In chapter 2, in verse 4, it talks about the love of God to them. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love, wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, and he has quickened us together with Christ. By grace are you saved, and he has raised us up together and made us to see together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Chapter 1, he mentioned love. Chapter 2, he mentioned love. Look at chapter 3, verse 17. Chapter 3, verse 17. That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye be rooted and grounded in love. Verse 19, and to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge. That he might, that she might be filled with all the fullness of God. Chapters 1, 2, 3. He mentioned love in chapter 4. Look at chapter 4, verse 2. With all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love. Verse 15. In verse 15, but speaking the truth in love, may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. From whom, verse 16, the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplies according to the effectual working in the measure of every part maketh increase of the body unto the define of itself in love. But chapter 5. In chapter 5, verse 2. And walk in love. Walk in love. Walk in love. As Christ also has loved us. And has given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for sweet smelling savor. In that same chapter 5, looking at verse 25, husbands love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Chapter 6. In chapter 6, verse 23, peace be unto the brethren and love with faith from God the Father. And the Lord Jesus Christ, and grace be with all them that love our Lord Jesus Christ in sincerity. Amen. You'll find that in every chapter of the epistle, that Paul the apostle had written to them, he mentioned love. Why is it that what is emphasized so much in every chapter, in every message, is what the church will forget, is what the church will abandon? As you think about that, can you think about our church? That there is no retreat. We don't mention something on salvation, sanctification, Christian living, holy living, obedience to the Lord, submission to the Lord. In every retreat, every worker's retreat, Every Congress, we must mention something about holiness, righteousness. Follow peace with all men, and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Why is it that it is what the apostle mentions in every chapter that the church will forget, that the church will abandon? Why is it that it is the love, it is the holiness, it is righteousness, it is the Christ-likeness that we mention every time, every time, every time that the church will forget? That's why the Lord was talking to this church, and the Lord said in Revelation chapter 2, Revelation chapter 2, verses 4 and 5, Nevertheless, have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. 
Remember therefore from whence thou art fallen. And then he requested them to do three things. He said, number one, they should remember. Number two, they should repent. repent. Number three, they should do the first works. He said, remember. Remember the first love. Number two, he said, repent of the loss of the first love. Repent of the loss of the first love. Number three, repeat the earlier actions and affections of the first love. What you did before. That made the Lord to be happy with you. That made the Lord to be pleased with you. Do that again. Do that again. Let there be fervent love and pure love unto the Lord and unto the body of Christ. A new commandment I give unto you. That you love one another as I have loved you. He said, remember, repent, repeat. Get the actions of love back again. Rediscover the actions and the affections of the first love. Otherwise, there will be a removal of the light. The light bearing candlestick. The question today, my brother, my sister, is do you still Love the Lord above money, above men or women, above ministry, above material things. Are you ministering in the place you are ministering now just because there is money there? Are you accepting to be an overseer, to be a pastor, to be a leader, to be whatever there, to be a teacher of the word of God because of the material things there? That region, that state, that nation, that place has money, has vehicles, has material things, has men, men that will support the church very well, men that will do this or do that. Is, it, is that the reason why you are there? Do you love the Lord above all those mundane things? Remember, repent, repeat. Do you still love Christ more than yourself? Do you exalt Christ more than yourself? Or is there self-will that now you put yourself above Christ? And if there is any challenge in ministry that is inconvenient for yourself, you say, Christ, I'm sorry, I cannot go beyond this point. This is inconvenient. I cannot do this. I love myself more than I love you. The Lord is saying, remember, repent, repeat. Do you still love Christ enough you know, to read his word every day, to hear him affectionately, and to obey him promptly, be sincere? Do you have quiet time? If you are not to preach, if you are not given any message, do you love the word of God? Here we are in this Congress. Maybe you are used to preaching at the Congress. And at this time now, there is no message. Are you interested? Are you just here because if you are not here, people will ask, why are you not there? When we come here early in the morning, do you drag your feet? And when other people are preaching, do you open the Bible? Because this time now, you are not preaching in this Congress. And you have always been preaching, always been preaching. Are you interested in the word of God? Do you embrace the word of God? Do you just cherish, that's my Lord talking to me. Through that preaching and through those references that are being quoted. And because of my love for the Lord, I must give in to that word and cherish that word. And drink in that word, soak in that word and eat up that word. Is it like that with you? Where is your first love? For the word of God. Remember, repent. Repeat. How deeply refreshing is your morning devotion? How deeply refreshing is your evening devotion, your quiet time? Remember? Repent and repeat. Are you still sensitive to his wish and to his will? Are you retaining that first love and you still love the Lord? Remember the prophecy. Because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall I wax cold. But I'm praying for you. Your love will not wax cold. Our love will not wax cold. As individuals, as a whole church, we'll keep on loving the Lord. And we'll keep on telling the Lord we're part of the fellowship of the unashamed. We have the Holy Ghost power. The die is cast. We have stepped over the line. Our decision has been made. 
were the disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ, we will not look back. Give me a good amen. amen. We will not let up. We will not slow down. We will not back away. We will not be still. Our past redeemed. Our present is making sense. Our future is secured. We are finished and done with low living. With sight walking. With small planning. With smooth knees. With colorless dreams. With tame vision. With mundane talking. With cheap living. With dropped goals. We no longer need preeminence. We're not looking for position. We're not looking for prosperity. We're not looking for promotion. We're not looking for popularity. Are you looking for popularity there? You want your pictures in the papers? You want them to know that you are the one, you are the pillar in deeper life. Doing this and doing that without you, a deeper life could not do what they, what they are doing. You want your pictures and your names in the newspapers. But no, we've gone beyond that now. We don't have time now to say, I'm right, I'm right. Defending ourselves ought to be forced, ought to be top, ought to be recognized, ought to be praised, to be regarded, to be rewarded. Just, just go ahead and do the work of God and just love the Lord. Just do it for the sheer love you have for the Lord. Recognized or not, now we're living by faith. And we lean on his presence. We're walking by patience and we live by prayer. We labor by power. Our faith is set. Our gate is fast. Our goal is heaven. Our road may be narrow, and then the way may be rough. Our companions will be few. Our guide reliable. Our mission is clear. We cannot be bought. I said we cannot be bought. We cannot be compromised. We cannot be deterred. We cannot be lured away. We cannot be turned back. We cannot be deluded or delayed. We will not flinch in the face of sacrifice will not hesitate in the presence of the adversary. will not negotiate at the table of the enemy. You know, enemies of the gospel calling us and saying, you know, if you will slow down, we love you. There are some good things you deeper life people you have. The only thing, the only thing we have against you, you're too much isolated. It's too much. Keep to yourselves. Bend a little. Compromise a little. Tolerate a little. Accept other people a little. And remove this one and remove this one and remove that one so that at least we will know that we are together. That, that's all we're asking, but never. It will never happen. We will not negotiate at the table of the enemy. Neither are we going to ponder at the pool of popularity or meander in the midst of mediocrity. We will not give up. We will not shut up. We will not let up until we have stayed up and stood up and prayed up and paid up and preached up the cause of Christ. We're disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. We will go on until he comes. I said we will go until he comes. And we'll give until we drop. We'll preach all we know. And we'll walk until he stops us. And when Jesus comes, when Jesus comes, when the dead are raised, and we who are alive, and we'll rise up together with, to go with them. When the saints of God are marching, I'll be there. I will be there. I will be there. Why don't you rise up and tell the Lord, repent, remember, repent, and repeat. Look at your life. Look at your life. And look at the things that the Lord has commended you for. You are doing it before. You're still doing it today. Or have you lost your first love? First love was sound doctrine in the church. Let the sound doctrine remain. Let the sound doctrine remain. And let the first love, let the first love, let it, let it come. Have you gone to sleep? If you are praying about healing, you'll open your mouth and be shouting. If you are praying for deliverance, you'll be opening your mouth and shouting. If you are praying for a car, you are praying for prosperity, you are praying for money, you'll open your mouth and you'll be shouting and screaming. Where are you today as we are talking about the love of God? The first love, the first love, the first love, that the fire and the warmth of fellowship and love will come back to your heart and come back to your mind. Love towards God. Love towards God. Love of the Lord Jesus Christ. Loveth me more than these. Can you endure because of your love for God? Can you endure because of your love for God? Or are there some things you cannot do now? That's not convenient for me. Where is your love? Are there some places you will not go now? I cannot do that. If they give me another assignment, that I will do. Where is your love for God? 
there is no car in that location and there are no material things in that location and uh, I know where I have been. How can I go to this new location? Where is your love for the Lord? Are you serving the Lord because of money, because of material things, because of wealthy men that are in that location? Is that why you are there? Or is it because you love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and you will do any sin for the glory of God? Are you still standing on the doctrines of the Bible in your life, in your family, in your character, in your preaching, in your ministry, in your location where you are? Are you still standing on this, on changing, on diluted word of God? Or are you modernizing it, changing it, diluting it, adulterating it, decreasing it? Are you no more standing on the word of God? Are you now accepting some false apostles to come and preach in deeper life pulpits? You're allowing backsliders to come and preach on the pulpit because you're looking for something. You're even raising money for them in deeper life. Is that you? Compromiser. Why don't you remember and repent and repeat the false words? The way you were strict before, the way you were firm before, and still come back on that same word of God and remain firm. Don't give up. 